Good morning. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our live webinar. Um, we are still live on Facebook Live as well. And also those of you who are on Zoom, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's always good to have some live audience. If you see, look at the screen, the guys on Zoom, you'll only be able to see me. And of course the questions which I'll be posing soon. And the guys on Facebook Live will be able to see a screen that's different from what you have. Nonetheless, this is the way we're going to deal with this um, interaction today. Perfect. Someone commented, we can hear me loud and clear. Wonderful. So there's two ways of interacting with me. Yes, we have questions on the whiteboard. I shall deal with all those questions. There are quite a few of them, about 15 of them, which I want to get past in the next um, hour. If you're on Facebook Live, you can leave a comment and I will look at that and I shall deal with that as well. And for those of you who are on Zoom, please remember you are allowed to deal and interact with me live. So if you want to say something, if you want to speak to me, please feel free to request an unmute and then um, I'll unmute you and we can converse. Remember your face won't necessarily be on the video, so I advise you in case a technical glitch might appear to, how can I explain to you now, not activate your camera. Many of you are, are doing that. And that will obviously assist us in, you know, trying to be anonymous and so on. So wonderful. If you have a question and you want to interact with me live, feel free to do so on Zoom. And put up your hand and you're welcome to do so. Yeah, the screen is a bit messy, but that is fine. So on Zoom, let me do one thing quickly. Let me share the screen, and the screen will obviously be the question that was posed. Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Let me sort something out here. It seems to be coming out a bit funny when I do that. Nonetheless, let me admit these people. Okay, sorry about that. Let us stop it for now. Okay, let's deal with the first question and feel free to interject at any time. Pose a question, put up a hand if you're on Zoom and we'll deal with that. Okay, today's topic, child custody, child maintenance and divorce, live Q&A for myself. I'll hopefully be able to assist you and guide you on the specific topic. About myself, I'm an advocate practicing as such for the last almost 20 years. So I'm a family law expert. I deal with a variety of family law legal matters, ranging from child custody, guardianship, relocation, uh, maintenance, domestic violence, and everything. Divorces, I deal a lot of divorces as well. And that's where my expertise comes in. Many people, they cannot afford legal representation or le legal advice. And that's the purpose of this webinar. And at the same time, many people can afford legal advice, but they don't get a chance to actually you know, and get some insightful um, advice regarding the Pacific matter. That's the purpose of this webinar. So the first question goes as follows. It's from Hao Ting and it says, my wife's attorney who is handling the divorce and is a acer, I presume, meaning plaintiff. And the person said, sorry, do not know the English. I found, um, I found is lying to the high court and impersonating the magistrate to cancel my contact to the son. So the person obviously wants to know what type of advice do I have for the specific person regarding that. Obviously, long and short of the matter is you're not allowed to impersonate a magistrate. It's obviously a criminal offense. So the first issue, the first thing we need to do is try to get rid of this magistrate or try to expose the magistrate or this person who's trying to impersonate um, himself as being the magistrate. So I cannot maybe take it further because that would most probably be the, the quick advice to you to deal with the matter on that specific basis. Um, lay a criminal complaint, speak to somebody and hopefully they can make some noise and they can deal with the specific issue. So let me go on the zoom one more time and try to share the screen. My apologies for this. I never done this since March. That's the last time we've done these um, these webinars. Okay, let's do that. I seem to still have an issue, a problem with this. Nonetheless, my apologies for that. And obviously the email questions will be emailed to each one of you afterwards. And you will be able to see this later on as well. Ah, there we are. No, sorry, there we are. Let 
Maybe get past that. Okay, then the second question, let us deal with that quickly. The second question that was posed, an interesting question, it goes as follows. Separated but married with the kids staying with me. Looking for financial help and a parenting plan from the father of the kids. I've initiated maintenance against the father, but his sister is paying the school fees. So that's what the, the person from Houting commented and stated. I do not have any additional information, so I'll try to deal with that. And hopefully I will be able to be um, of some assistance regarding that specific question. Okay. Regarding child maintenance, if a party is separated from the other parent and you're not living together anymore, maintenance will obviously have to be determined based upon your means. Okay, so if somebody is earning quite well, automatically what that means is that specific person will have to pay more child support or support the child more than the other party. That makes logical sense. So here the parties are separated, they were married for three years, and the kids are sorry, they're married, and the kids are obviously living with the one party of the three kids. Now he's looking for financial help, and, and obviously they're tied to enter into a parenting plan. He initiated the maintenance matter against the father, but the sister is paying the school fees. That's the information I have, so I'll try to be, you know, creative and try to assist uh, the specific party over here. The sister has no legal obligation to pay the school fees. Obviously, the sister is paying the school fees on behalf of the specific parent. Under those circumstances, that is fine, and it can be seen that the specific sister is paying the maintenance, or the specific parent is paying the maintenance, but the sister is doing it on behalf of that specific parent. My advice to you is, unpack exactly what the needs of the child is, are, or the kids are, the three children are, work out exactly what your specific income, potential income is, and also the other party's income. And that is most probably the starting blocks on where this matter will have to be dealt with or, you know, um, action from. Once you have determined that specific date and that specific information, then you'll be in a very, in a much better position in order to advise the maintenance court on coming to a fair conclusion regarding child maintenance. So that's a basic advice I have regarding the question that has been posed from the specific commenter. Let me change the screen quickly. Okay, it. Let us move on. Please, those of you who are on Zoom, you are welcome to interact with me live. I have no problem with that. And we can um, hopefully be able to advise and assist you properly. Okay, the third question we have received is from Konzulu Natal. The question goes as follows. Can the father change the maintenance amount according to his own calculations to exclude things he thinks is not needed? Like exclude the nanny's fees even though I need her because I work. Now this is a challenge um, people will have. If the parties cannot come to an agreement regarding child maintenance, it's not for one party to decide, um, I make the decision as to what is fair and reasonable. No, that doesn't work that way. Maintenance, as I mentioned earlier on, is, a, is determined according to the party's needs, their means, the child's needs and the child's means and so on. So therefore, when you come to the scenario, you might say, I require the following and the father should be paying this. Maybe he should not be paying that. Or maybe he should be paying more. I do not know. So I always advise people, if you want to have a fee assessment on child maintenance, you need to have this matter properly resolved in a maintenance court, in a proper forum. So here we're having a situation where the person believes he's entitled to, for example, the nanny fees. But the father believes he's not entitled, he should not be paying that. I do not know, my guess is as good as you, maybe you're earning more than the father, maybe you're earning less, or maybe the father should be paying that. The bottom line is, if the parties cannot come to an agreement, it's silly for you guys to go on like this. Um, where the father believes he must pay for this, and the mother believes he must not pay for this, or whatever the case may be. Try to resolve it as quickly as possible. If you cannot resolve it, one of you have to take the matter to the maintenance court. And here, obviously, it will have to be the mother. It's possible for the other party also to take a matter to the maintenance court if, for example, there is a maintenance order in place and you want to vary that specific maintenance order. Um, from KwaZulu Natal, I hope I answered your question. That was the third question. If I did not answer it properly, feel free to put up your hand um, if you are on Zoom now at present and um, add additional comments and hopefully I'll be able to assist you and advise you accordingly. I'm seeing we are having some technical issues here regarding the screens. Um, hopefully in part two, next week and Saturday, we can sort out all these glitches. But thank you, thank you anyway for partaking. Question number four. We go this one as follows. And this question also arrived from KwaZulu Natal. The reason why I'm mentioning the province is because 
um, it will just connect you to the question. Many people that pose these questions, but they do not know. Later on, they do not know if they pose a question or someone else pose a question. Of course, I copy these questions verbatim as it was received from you. With the spelling mistakes, with the grammar mistakes, none of us are perfect. So you can just double check later on if it was your question. Question number four. How do I find my ex-husband who has immigrated to New Zealand? I think it's immigrated. He has defaulted in child maintenance. I like many other parents feel exhausted and the justice system does not help either now this is a bit of a challenge because here we're dealing with international maintenance if a party immigrated to a different country now obviously south africa um, courts does not have power in a different jurisdiction the same way that the cape town court doesn't have power in the johannesburg court um, the high court in the western Cape does not necessarily have power to the johannesburg court but here we're dealing with countries whereby how can a South African order be implemented in a different country? But there is something called RIMO, the Reciprocal Enforcement of Maintenance Orders Act. That is, it's, an, it's, it's, it's sorry, my apologies. It is an international agreement between South Africa and various other countries. You will need to determine whether or not South Africa has an agreement with New Zealand. If there is an agreement with New Zealand, you can enforce a maintenance order made in South Africa to another country, to another signatory country. So you need to look into that. However, if South Africa does not have an agreement with New Zealand, unfortunately, there's not much you can do unless he has assets and property in South Africa. I hope that answered your specific question. If I have not, please let me know. Okay, somebody put up their hands. I see somebody wants to ask a question. I will unmute that person and hopefully we can um, deal with that question live. Please go ahead. I'm unmuting you. Or you may unmute yourself. There is it. You're welcome. <coughs> Good morning, Good morning, Edith. How are you? Good, thanks. I have um, a question regarding um, primary residence. So um, I've got divorced like six years ago, and um, my ex and I, we, we reconciled a few months after we got divorced. But um, at the start of this year, I decided to move back home to KZN. Um, you know, it wasn't working. So we have an eight year old together. And, um, you know, the advice that I was giving moving from Joburg to Durban was that I could. And I've informed him I'm in KZN. However, he's now challenging primary residence. Um, he would like my son to be with him in Johannesburg. Um, we are going, we've had our inquiries with the family advocates. I just wanted to know, um, you know, a bit of insight as to, you know, grounds in challenging primary residence. Um, when I left, I, I left without a job, but, you know, I'm in a position now to provide for my child. Um, you know, so my son is in Joburg with him based on the interim order. He had to go back to his old school and he's with his dad. So now I'm just waiting for outcome from the family advocate. I'm not sure if I should um, you know, like be in contact with them to just find out how's it going because they just, they, they did advise me that, you know, they're in a backlog with COVID and they under enormous pressure. So I don't want to come across as being too pushy at the same time, but, you know, I need, I need something for now because, I mean, schools are closed because of COVID, but at the same time, primary residence is being in dispute. So any advice for me on that one? Now, let's stay on the line quickly. Um, let me just get this right. So after you guys divorced, you were the primary resident, uh, primary caregiver of the child um, while you were living in the same problems with the father. Since you've moved, the interim order stipulated that the child should now at least in the interim remain with the dad. Correct. You can stay online. Um, you can stay online, or you can, um, of course, inter interact with me via Zoom. But further, so the challenge you have here is. When the court deals with a matter regarding primary care of a minor child, the court obviously focuses on what's best in a minor child and his circumstances, etc. Not necessarily what the parents want. The advantage a father here obviously has is that this child's school is in his province and it makes logical sense for the minor child to remain there. You need to obviously now be strategic if you want to have primary residence of your minor child. You need to now start being proactive in the sense of, okay, I want my child to come to live in my province. What would be in his best interest? Obviously, making sure there's an adequate school for him to stay in there. What are the advantages the child has by living with me? Of course, I've always been his primary caregiver. I know when he gets ill. I know his moods. I know his 
everything about him. So those are advantages of having you as a primary caregiver. The sticklier year obviously is the minor child school. Then also the other aspect regarding the father, can he adequately care for the minor child as well as you can care for the minor child? Obviously not, you can do a better job where that is concerned. So you need to hate that, that um, present that specific scenario which I mentioned now to the family advocate and let the family advocate be convinced, you know what, okay, Yes, the child's school is here by the father, but it will be holistically more advantageous for the child to live with the mother. He will be better cared for, better, better looked after. If the father has more money, that is fine, but he can pay more maintenance to the mom. But at the end of the day, you must just make a very good argument to stipulate, yes, the child will be, de be deprived at least by, go by leaving his old school, but he has just as a good school. Children adopt, and there's no reason why the child should not be in my province, live with me, be cared mm -hmm. for me, and... You'll, you'll, you'll thrive there from. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. I see there's another another hand. Um, I think your hand is coming down. Any other hands up there before I go with the next question? You're welcome to put up your hand and I will unmute your, um, your microphone or you can unmute it yourself and you're welcome to pose any additional questions to me. Let us carry on and um, hopefully soon I'll see somebody's hand up to pose, me, pose another question. Question number five from the Northern Cape. If my ex and I split, we were never married, that's fine, and he now has decided to get married to someone else. Does he and the wife have a better chance of getting custody over me, a single mom? Okay, one of those difficult questions to answer because um, I do not have too much data coming here, but I presume that the mother is the one who's primarily caring for the minor child and the father is the one that's remarried and he has contact quite often to the child, but he's not the primary caregiver. That's why there's now a custody dispute regarding this. In principle, there is no reason to stipulate that because a party remarried or married to somebody else, they are in a better position to care for a minor child. That's nonsense. That There's no principle where that is concerned. I've done many cases whereby the reason why we were successful in receiving primary care for the one party was because the other party met someone else and remarried. There's a lot of things that can, can, can play a role. For example, the other party might have, uh, the new party, the step parent might have, uh, for example, uh, kids from previous relationship. The house might be crowded, the room might be small, um, they might be arguing a lot, and the mother's situation, situation is obviously better and, and more reasonable under the circumstances. So, under those circumstances, I do not, on principle, stipulate that that is necessary and an advantage. It could be, depending upon the circumstances, it could also be a disadvantage. You need to focus, the person from the Northern Cape, you need to focus that you can care for the minor child better than that specific scenario. That is what the court will ultimately have to decide. Who, which parent can care for the child much better, considering all these factors. And if you can show that, and you can show to the court going forward, I will look after the child much better, then obviously the court would make that order in, in your favor. I have, that's question number five, I have a question on the Zoom. It says the following, is a father allowed to withhold maintenance when the kids visit for a few weeks? One of those difficult questions, because I believe math maintenance are mathematical equations. Um, the long and the short of the matter is no, but it also depends upon various circumstances, for argument's sake. If the maintenance is being paid for certain type of expenditure, for example, aftercare, extramural activities, um, certain expenditure which are, are not being incurred at all during this time that the minor children are with the father, then clearly it doesn't make logical sense for the father to continue paying those specific expenditure. At the same time, the argument can be made if the, if the child is with this father now for a few weeks and the father now has to spend a lot of money on food and um, cert certain things which he has to obviously incur because the kids are with him, he can bring up an argument, you know, the kids were with me for the last few weeks, I spent so much more money on them because, uh, and the mother, the other party, uh, who is a primary giver, saved a lot of money with this is concerned. If it's for a few weeks, like two or three weeks, I would say no, there's no case to, to be made because at the same time, many times the primary caregiver incurs more money than what the maintenance order says, more expenditure, my apologies, what the maintenance order says. So it doesn't necessarily cut, cut there. But if it's for a long period of time, like two or three months, then I can strongly argue that the person who is supposed to pay maintenance, who now cared for the minor child for the last two or three months, 
Good have like a really good case of stipulator. <clears throat> During that three months, I paid for all the water, the food, the clothing, the accommodation, everything. And the other parties saved there. There needs to be a re-look regarding that specific uh, amount. I do not think it, it will be correct to stipulate that you can withhold. There needs to be a discussion and an agreement. And if the agreement cannot be amicable or agreed up, the parties can't agree to it, then obviously one part will have to go to court. So if the maintenance order stipulates that the father must pay, and he feels now, okay, it's now two months down the line, he must still continue paying the maintenance because they can't come to an agreement, then he needs to post a maintenance court for variation of the order. And he can have it backdated as well. I hope it answers that specific question, and if I, if I did not answer it, you are welcome to pose an additional question to that. Question number six, from the Western Cape, where I'm from. Son had a case at the High Court, Cape Town. He stopped at the mother, put the child on question through many things. I asked the paternal, I asked the paternal grandmother, I presume, um, went forward. The advocate that advised handing the current case said I. On all honesty, I copied and pasted that. I didn't know what it entailed, but that's a question from the person from the Western Cape, question number six. If you have any additional comment to that, question number six, just leave me a note and I will deal with that a bit further. I do not know how to answer that question. Let us deal with question number seven from Kazulu Natal. When your kids and you are still on the family trust, what are the benefits and what are the benefits? Okay, what happens when the divorce? Please may you discuss family trust benefits. Okay, the, I'll be short and I, and, and I told myself and I told you as well, I'll deal with all questions posed. A family trust will only be to your advantage and to your benefit if there are money and assets involved in it. That makes logical sense. But the one true advantage would be that the assets of a family trust is not the assets necessarily per se of the beneficiaries or the trustees. It's separate from that. And if there are assets in the trust, um, and money that can be withdrawn on a monthly basis, you can look after the beneficiaries of trust. So generally, the father and the mother will open up a trust for the for them and the minor kids. They must probably put some money over the whatever the case may be. Should any problems happen regarding the mother and the father's assets, they become insolvent, the money will still be in the trust, and the trust can continue looking after them. At the same time, should something happen to the parents, whatever the case may be, the trust can still continue looking after the minor kids. So those are the advantages of having a trust. It's separate from the estate and the assets of the individuals. And it is a working, uh, a working structure in the sense of even if the parents are no longer there, it still has life. It still has to look after the beneficiaries. For example, it can stipulate um, it should continue paying the interest or the profits or the rental received from the property that belongs to the trust to the minor children until they turn 21 years old or self-supporting and when the, when the younger child turns 18 years old or is self-supporting then automatically then the trust can be dissolved and all the proceeds can be or the, or the assets can be distributed or sold and distributed to the beneficiaries. Okay, if you have any anybody from the Zoom, you're welcome to pose any questions. I'm happy to take your, uh, put up your hand and I'll be able to deal with that. Let me have a look at Facebook Live. There is no movement there, so that is okay for now. We are ending this uh, webinar on the dot at 12. I had an agreement with um, some construction people. They are knocking here, so they, They'll be keeping quiet until 12 o'clock, so we'll have to wrap it up until then. But I'm sure we will do well. But that's why, if you have any questions, and I have questions, please pose it now and put up your hand. Let us deal with question number eight from KwaZulu Natal. Okay, that's great. KwaZulu Natal is quite active today in this webinar. How do you, how do we go about using a state lawyer if one is unemployed? Okay, state lawyers, legal aid. That's what I'm hearing here. State employed. Um, it depends. I mean, the Legal Aid Board does not deal, deal with all matters. Of course, if you are an accused in a criminal matter, they will definitely assist you. Um, but maybe, for example, maybe, I'm just speaking for example, let's say um, somebody knocked into your car and now you want to sue um, a third party, they might not assist you regarding that. Um, but for Legal Aid, you need to go on the website, find out where they are, your, your nearest Legal Aid Department office, go to them, they'll do a means test and they'll determine whether or not you qualify. If you are very wealthy, 
Of course not, you will not qualify. Why should they give free legal service for people that are extremely wealthy? If you are, if you cannot afford legal representation and require legal representation, for example, a criminal matter, they will appoint somebody to assist you regarding that. So I hope that, that answered your specific question. Okay, I have a question here. Let me deal with that quickly from Hao Ting before we go on to question number nine. Another question. I'm a single mother, three to oldest from previous marriage. Okay, the youngest one's father claims to be unemployed, although I see him going to work. He also owns a house, pays a bond, and he can easily live with his retired mother. Okay, he changes the maintenance amount according to what he thinks he can afford. Every time he, every time this happens. I come short because I have to still pay the expenditure. Okay, that is a question over there. Yeah, that's a question, and I'll do that question now. So, bottom line is the father says he's unemployed, he can't afford the maintenance, but he works, he pays a bond, and he can live by his mom. Now, he pay. He decides what he wants to pay, and the bottom line is the mother cannot, um, you know, continue with a month because every month comes, she is short, etc. She needs to approach the, the person on Zoom that left a comment. You need to go to the maintenance court. You need to resolve this matter as soon as possible. If there is a maintenance order in place and it's paying short, of course, it's a criminal offense. They should do something about it. And we all know being in contempt of a court order, we see it in the media, is quite serious. If there is no maintenance order in place, bottom line is approach a maintenance court as soon as possible and they'll have to do an investigation and inquiry. It needs to be done. It might take some time. It needs to be done. And the maintenance court will make a decision as to what would be a fair amount and it will be an order of court. So the father will have be forced to pay that amount. And he owns assets. I see he owns a house and so on. So that can also ultimately be sold to pay for the child's maintenance. So that's important to note. I hope I answered that question. The bottom line is you need to do something about it. Okay, I have another live question from the Zoom. Can a Rule 43 be brought to the respondent after the talaks been given? If I'm working, can you can your long-term savings be taken into account as well, like retirement? So I think that's a um, talak. Obviously, we're referring to Muslim marriages here. Um, Muslim marriages are not recognized as valid civil marriages, therefore your assets of the parties aren't necessarily taken into consideration. And there needs to be some type of a legal basis as, as to why you want to bring your assets and your retirement investments into the picture. Okay, so the, but the question, the question over here is on the child custody. It goes a bit further. Let me go further. If a person has a mental condition and has a history of substance abuse, can the non-primary parent have sleepover contact? Okay, let me first deal with the first question. I think the same questioner has two questions. A Rule 43 is a application in the High Court for dealing with interim maintenance, um, contribution towards legal cost, and dealing with care and contact regarding minor children. Those are the three things that Rule 43 application deals with. The other parties have divorced, they have resolved their marriage, um, I do not see the basis upon why a Rule 43 order application will necessarily be made. The marriage is over. If there is a dispute potentially regarding the marriage or the issue regarding that, then of course a Rule 43 application could possibly be made because there is a dispute regarding the marriage. Um, however, if the marriage has been resolved, that's it and, and in my view the parties will have to continue with their lives. Regarding the second question, if a person has a mental condition and has a history of substance abuse, can the non-primary parent have sleepover contact. So I would imagine the parent, there's two scenarios here I'm seeing here, either the parent who is a primary caregiver has those specific challenges, that's unfortunate, and then the question is can the non-primary parent have sleepover contact. Sleepover contact either way, whether or not you have a mental condition, whether or not you're abusing substance, etc., it must be in the minor child's best interest. Full stop. And I'll be blunt here and I'll, and I'll talk as a lawyer. It does not mean, in principle, that if somebody is abusing substances, he or she is not allowed to have contact or sleep over contact, okay? Because it, there are different levels of substance abuse. If the substance abuse takes place away from a minor child and at, at days and time when the minor child is not with a specific parent, then of course the legal answer would be that can contact would, would not have to be limited based upon something that happens at different times. However, if the person is abusing um, substances and so on um, at 
times when he or she is not having contact with a minor child, but it affects the contact ultimately, then of course it's an important factor. So what the court looks at and what the law looks at as is not necessarily whether or not you're abusing substance, because that's not how the law works. We don't say because of this, we checklist. Um, we still have to look at the matter holistically and properly. If the substance abuse has a detrimental effect on the potential or the dealing with the aspect regarding overnight contact, then of course overnight contact should not take place. If it does not play a role, if it does not affect the quality or the safety of the minor child when overnight contact takes place, then of course overnight contact should take, may take place, put it that way. I hope that answered that specific question. And I see there's another question on the Zoom. But before I get to that, let me first deal with question 9 from the Western Cape. Question 9 from the Western Cape says the following. Maintenance of the years, non-compliant children's court, not doing anything about the years. So I'm presuming that's a statement and someone wants me to comment regarding that. Okay. If a person is in maintenance of the years, the maintenance court should be able to, should, should assist you. Um, not necessarily the children's court. It will be the maintenance court. And the maintenance court has two options. They can either deal with a civil route where they, buy, where they can assist you in attaching um, the person's assets, for example, his car, selling the car, his bank account, taking money from the bank account, or having his employer pay you the maintenance directly, a garnish order. So those are the things that could potentially um, happen and take place. However, not the children's court. So my advice to you is to approach the maintenance court, not the children's court. If they aren't assisting you and made a mistake here, and you mentioned um, ma ma sorry, children's court by mistake, my advice to you is to start complaining and to speak to the relevant people. Go up the ladder. Uh, I know with COVID-19, some courts, I'm not mentioning any names here, but they are maybe a bit more, um, not as enthusiastic to assist people as they would have been had it not been COVID-19. That is no excuse. You are being paid, you have a job to do, you should do your job to the best of, of your capability. So therefore my advice to the Western Cape question number 9, please go to the maintenance court, lay the complaints, criminal complaint or the civil, if they do not assist you, go up the ladder, speak to the manager, go up to the, to the Western Cape um, Provincial Minister of Justice, speak to him um, and make some noise. That would be my advice to you. How does one go about getting a copy of a court file from the children's court and the grandmother and would like to a second opinion on what the social worker is reporting. So that's question number 10 from Gauteng. Okay, this is the challenge you have regarding children's courts. If you want a copy of the court file, the magistrate will have to give you, authorize you receiving a copy thereof. You cannot just request I would like to have a copy, even me as a legal representative to a party, and I can do it many times. When I get instructed and briefed by an attorney to appear in the children's court, I see we have a bit of a challenge here. Ah, we're back online again. Something happened over there. Okay, even me, when I get instructed and briefed to appear for a client in the children's court, I need to specifically request from the main, from the magistrate or via the clerk for a copy of the court file and I have to give reasons therefore. So it seems to me the files in the children's court are quite locked. You know, they were say, sealed. So if you want a copy of that, you're welcome to do so. Go to the clerk of the children's court and ask the clerk to ask the magistrate whether or not you can get a copy of it. And if you have good reasons, they'll give you a copy of the file. Uh, but you are a third party, you're not the parent, so it might be a bit challenging, but I would say try your luck and see what you can do. Now we get into question number 11. If anybody wants any additional questions, you're welcome to pose it from the Zoom and the Zoom chat, which I've seen there are a few questions, or you can put up your hand and deal with it live. Question number 11 from Gauteng. 
When a child is removed from the primary residence and placed in a place of safekeeping by the Department of Social Development, social worker, after false accusations were made, what are, my, what are your rights and recourse against a biased social worker? So what happened is, this is obviously a children's court matter, um, a complaint was laid and see the child is in danger or not being looked after, neglected, and they place the child in type of foster care for safekeeping. Under those circumstances, um, a social worker obviously done some investigation and then um, you are not happy with that. Obviously, if you're not happy with that, you're you, you welcome to do say that. But if you are saying that this person was biased, you'll be able to prove that this person is biased. And obviously, the first way to do that is to complain to this person's boss, go up the ladder. If, however, you feel the person is biased and at the same time, the matter is pending in the children's court and you disagree with that, you can present an argument why you think the person is being biased, but at the same time, you can also come with another expert, another opinion as to why a different decision would have been taken had the person not been biased. I see my hand going up. You're welcome to unmute yourself and chat on the... I'll ask you to unmute. You're welcome to go ahead. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Hi it's my daughter's, daughter's question. And with regard to the um, case, it's still ongoing in court. And we just wanted to know, how would we present that to the magistrate? Do we have to fill in any kind of documentation to tell her that we would like a second opinion? Or how does, how does it, work? it work? So am I dealing with a question from how 10 question I believe? Yes, yes, that one you've just been dealing with. Okay. So the... The challenge I have, the challenge you may have is that because the report is most probably not in your favor, the court and everybody else might think because of the, the, the report is not in my favor, automatically I have a challenge with that and now I'm saying the person is unbiased, is now being unbiased, or being biased, sorry. Um, the, the, the way I will challenge something like that, and I'll be honest with you, is not necessarily attacking Say the person is being biased. Yeah. I will unpack the report and stipulate exactly how did it come about that the report is flawed, that the logic applied by this person does not make logical sense, because that will speak better to another person. So, for example, if the person, mm -hmm. for example, comes with an allegation that was unsubstantiated, that are, that are thumb sucked, and that will be the way how you will attack that. So you need to sit down with pen and paper and say this doesn't make sense. Or, for example, say what happens many times with these reports, the people, so, these um, social workers, they put data in there that was never told by the parties. Or they come to yes. conclusions that doesn't make logical sense at all, no matter how you look at it. And that mm -hmm. is what you need to bring to the attention of the magistrate. Because if, if um, magistrates and court officials, I mean, they deal with hundreds of files on a regular basis, you just one file and they look at, they, when they read through these reports, they, they jump. And I do it many times myself. The moment I receive a report, I go one time, I immediately go to the last page and look at the recommendations. Because I don't have much time, at least I have to study it for court. Now the magistrate mm -hmm. might do that. So my advice to you is, unpack that report, deal with it properly, um, say why you have a problem with that. And at the same time, maybe take that report to another professional person and find out if that prof professional person agrees to that. And that might be able to assist you, assist you regarding it. Um, how do we present that? Uh, so when we go and we put it down on a piece of paper, do we just create an affidavit which we then present to the magistrate? Yeah, so in children's court matters, um, you, you generally you, you orally speak in the uh, before the magistrate in children's court matter as opposed to a high court matter. So regarding your circumstances here, not necessarily an affidavit, uh, I do not think that's necessary. Maybe there's a response, you know, a written response to the problems you have with the specific report and you file that at the clerk of the court. Um, affidavit will only kick in, for example, if there are factual um, problems you may have. For example, if the social worker says no, the child is six years old, but the child is actually five years old or four years old. And okay, um, okay. Then, then you can say under oath, you know, because now you're confirming with evidence. But if it's arguments which you want to challenge um, regarding the social worker's report, for that specific stuff, you do not have to be able to be necessary. This is an argument. So the magistrate can see now this is the response I have regarding this specific report. And send that response also to the social worker as well. And you or she can obviously have a look at it as well. So everybody can, uh, opinions can be you know, presented. Okay. Um, um, you just get, hand that into the, to the clerk prior to this case being heard. heard. Yeah. So prior what, the next 
Yeah, the way I will do it is yes. So, so you receive the report of the of the social worker. Um, mm -hmm. I would most probably just email it to the clerk of the court and ask him or her to give it to the magistrate. Then it, then it's on record. And it needs to be dealt with. You see that the difficulty we have in these in these type of matters, especially if you are a lay person and underrepresented, you talk and you argue and it goes through the one ear, into the one ear and out of the other ear. But if it's on, on paper, it's always there. And if you challenge these decisions on appeal or review, automatically it was on the record and the court will have to apply their minds to it. Very well. Thank you very much for answering that. You have helped me tremendously. Welcome. I hope, I hope you get justice. And, and, I, and, I, and I love it, honestly. Um, people need to start owning their cases. You know, you you are in the system. The magistrate's job is not here to, to be the umpire and decide how you guys play the game. You play your own games as to the best as you can, and the courts have an obligation to, to decide on what's best for the minor child. Yes, but they can't tell you how to present your case. You have that duty, and you have that right and privilege to be able to present your case and to deal with the case how you think is fit. So thank you for that. So let me deal okay. quickly with you. You're welcome. Um, let me deal with um, question number thirteen from Pumalanga. That's nice to hear people from Pumalanga. Hi, section twenty-one of the Act. I think presume the Children's Act. Unmarried fathers, rights of unmarried fathers, stayed with the girlfriend till the kids were two. Okay. She damaged my property after an argument and had to move out. I asked for the kids to remain, but failed. Why are my rights as police help out her? So I'm still typing it out verbatim with all the WhatsApp type of um, short shorthand writing. But anyway, nonetheless, um, you as a father, you acquire full parental rights and responsibilities with a mother if you are involved in a child's life since a child's birth. So that is fine. Um, if you have acquired that right, if you wanted to form part of the child's life, you paid child support, you, you maintained the child, whatever is reasonably possible, and now the mother decides, now, okay, I am now the mother, and therefore I can decide what's in the child's best interest. That's obviously nonsense. So my advice to you is, go to the children's court, let the court hear this matter, let the court make a decision as what's best for the minor child. If it does mean you must have limited contact and the court believes that is the case, there's nothing I can do regarding that. However, the court will obviously have to de decide what's best for the minor child, and generally, um, what's best for the minor child is not necessarily what one or uh, what the other party wants. The court will make that decision. So that's from Apuma Langa, and I hope I've answered that question. And hopefully we can go to question number 14, 15, 16, and 17. Okay, those are the last questions on the whiteboard. But before I deal with that, let me first deal with the question which I have on Zoom. Okay, I have a question on the Facebook as well, but it's basically a question regarding the zoom link unfortunately it will be too late to send the link out now because you are watching this but please note we are having a webinar next week and saturday as well we will be better set up for that one um, and any questions or any part participation you'd like to make you are welcome to do so with me that's next week okay so here we are back on the back on the f zoom i'll make sure I, I should just make sure i do not lose out any questions Okay, here we go. My son is spending time with his dad's side of the family today. My son messaged me to fetch him and he's scared. His dad is not around. Can I go through and fetch my son and try or try? Is it not a good idea? I'm available right now to fetch my son. He's clearly unhappy. And I'm available right now, okay. To fetch my son. It's basically repeating that. Okay, this is a difficult question for me to answer. I mean, I, in isolation, I mean, if the other parent has rights of care and contact, that person must exercise that contact. It's not for one parent just to go and, and um, play around with the care and contact rights. The first thing I would do is contact the father, discuss this matter with the father, ask the father, why are you not with the child? Remember, it's not for a child to decide what is best for the child. For the same, scenario, for the same reason, I will, and I will say this, Let's say to the mother, your child decides, no, mommy, I do not want to stay by you this week. You know, I want to stay by dad, and it's your week on. Do we listen to the child wholeheartedly, or, or do we apply our independent mind to this? My advice to you is, um, find out from the father why is the child unhappy, what is happening there, why the child not with you. Because we all know many times, parents have care and contact over a minor child, but 
you know, they have to do certain things, and for one or two or three hours, a child can have to be cared for by third parties or be alone if, it's, if a child is safe and so on. Then later on, you, you exercise contact. It wouldn't make sense, for example, if a child gets picked up by the dad, taken to the mother from picked up the dad at eight o'clock in the morning, taken back to the mother at twelve o'clock or two o'clock, collect from the mother um, at two o'clock, and now the dad must quickly back to work at three at five o'clock and drop the child. It doesn't make sense, you know, up and down, up and down. It doesn't mean the child must always be physically in the care of one child, depending upon the age and maturity and so on. To be careful here, and I wouldn't want to advise you just to collect the minor child. Speak to the father tonight to come to some type of understanding. Can I collect my child? What's happening there, etc. At the end of this contact period, then of course this matter must be properly re looked at. Then I would advise you, please speak to a parenting coordinator, speak to a social worker, speak to some professional person to try to resolve this because we do not want this to happen again in the future. So I'm very weary or very loath in stipulating collect your child. I mean, what am I basing that upon? You know, some text messages here. I cannot do that. My advice to you is speak to the father, contact the father, communicate with him, and find out exactly what you can do. And if he says, okay, fine, you can collect your son or child, wonderful, please do so. But please, please try to um, resolve this matter soon after this contact period has come to an end. I hope that answers your question. Another live question on the Zoom. Does the case go to the children's court when the agreement signed at the family advocate is breached? I am nervous that he will get more rights than what he deserves if I go to the court. So I've been tolerating the short payments out of fear. Okay, the family advocate can have the parties enter into an agreement, but that agreement will basically be useless unless it is registered with the family advocate's office, uh, PNT plan registered in terms of section 33 of the Children's Act, alternatively made an order of court. If it's only an agreement, it doesn't really mean much. It's just a piece of document signed by the parties. It has a bit of value in it as to what the parties intended, but it doesn't have any legal effect in that specific regard. If we understand where I'm going to. So court order, as opposed to an agreement assigned, it's two different documentation. Um, if a party is not adhering to this agreement, yes, you need to take the matter to court. I cannot tell you not to. Um, sometimes the courts will agree to the specific agreement, or sometimes the court will come to a different um, conclusion based upon the facts and circumstances of the matter. Um, my advice to you is, if the person is not paying child maintenance, is not, not doing what he or she is supposed to do, you're supposed to enforce your rights. I always have a policy of moving forward as opposed to taking punches and holding back. Um, you believe that the child will be best in your care, or you believe that the care and contact arrangements are in the child's best interest, you need to fight for that and you do uphold that. Do not, you know, be bullied by the other party, you know, by... You know, I will not pay, I will pay less maintenance, but if you go to the children's court, you might get less contact. That's not the way we want to deal with these type of matters. It's not in the child's best interest. Okay, before we deal with Western Cape, question number 15, the last three questions, let us deal with the questions coming from Zoom. What happens if I pass away primary residence and the father not in a position to take care of the child? What route should my parents or siblings take if they want the child to be in their care? We married but separated, no physical contact with the child, only video call twice a week. Automatically, because you are married to the other party, um, you, both parties have full parental rights and responsibilities of guardianship, care, and so on. Should something happen to you, automatically the father will be the sole guardian over the minor child, and he can take the child away, and the grandparents and the sisters and the brothers have no rights over the child. That's the way it is. If you are concerned that should the father, uh, should something happen to you, and um, the father will automatically be the sole holder of parental rights responsibilities and take the child away and is not in the child's best interest and you want to reign from the grave. I'm just giving some advice over here. Um, you need to speak to your family now and advise your family. Family, if something happens to me, immediately go to the high court or see an attorney or speak to somebody and immediately make an application in terms of Section 2425 of the Children's Act for an a third party like you to acquire certain parental rights and responsibilities. That is possible to be done. So you need to have the conversation now with your family, or maybe now they speak to an attorney regarding that. And should something happen to you, they should immediately approach a court and try to enforce the rights. So that what we'll basically do is, let's say you, something happens to you, heaven forbid, but say, let's say something does happen to you now, but obviously the child was with you and the father on a video contact. Now the next day, after they buried you, 
immediately, or maybe before the bailiff, immediately your parents should approach high court and say, Judge, the mother passed away, the father only had every, every contact, every, whenever by video contact. We would like to keep the status quo for the child to remain with us until there's a full blown investigation by the Office of the Family Advocate to determine what is best for the minor child. So you're maintaining the status quo. So that's how I will deal with that matter strategically going forward. Okay. I saw another question come in over here. So that's the last question on the Zoom. We're ending at 12 as I said. So let me first properly deal with those next three questions and I can go back to the Zoom. And if you want to put up your hand, you're welcome to put up your hand and I'll unmute you. Question number 14. A parenting agreement was signed in the children's court and the father no longer is paying for maintenance and refuses to pay any more than 500 rand for the support of the child. I don't know what the question is, um, but if a party is not paying an adequate amount of money which you believe is reasonable and which you believe he, 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 he can afford to pay. My advice to you strongly is go to the maintenance court. The maintenance court will obviously make a, a decision and determine what is a fair and adequate amount to pay. So the general children's court doesn't deal with maintenance matters. They deal with care and contact arrangements. I hope that answers the question from how Ting. If I have not, we have a few moments to deal with that. Okay, today I, I have to just push the video for, for the sole reason that um, at 12 o'clock these construction people are starting to work in this building. However, next week we will have this webinar again and any questions I did not deal with adequately, you are welcome to engage with me next week. Same time, um, same place. Question number 15. Do I have to inform my ex about my children's lives if he is not paying maintenance? Do I have to inform my ex that I'm getting married, we share three kids, can I cut communication because of verbal abuse? This is the challenge you have. Now you do not inform the other party what happens then. There will always be controversies, there will always be, be issues. My advice to any parents, any parents who are separated, you need to communicate. You need to go for co-parenting counseling. You need to become the best co-parenting for your, co for your child. That's very important. Um, if there's a court order in place stipulating that you need to communicate and you have to deal with these specific issues via email, you need to do that. So I would strongly advise you, I mean you the marrying, it, it will come out. Send an email to the other party. If the other party is being abusive, go to the domestic violence court, get a protection order. So you have a protection order limiting the other party from abusing you emotionally, psychologically, etc. But you still communicate with this person and tell the person, you could have a protection order. So be respectful here. But I'm informing you that I'm getting married, X, Y, and Z. So I strongly advise for the sake of the child, for parents to continuously communicate with each other. So I cannot say do not communicate. I cannot say do cut that communication. You must try your best that you can do in order for you to avoid that scenario from happening. Question number 16 from KwaZulu Natal. Thank you KwaZulu Natal. Hopefully next week we'll have more from KwaZulu Natal and from other provinces as well. I'd like insight on having an X-file for primary residence. I'm in KwaZulu Natal and he's in Johannesburg and he wants residence of an 8 year old child. Yeah. Had an inquiry with a family advocate but I'm still waiting. Okay, so I'd like to insight on having an X file for primary residency. The bottom line is the courts and the family advocates determine what is best for the minor child. They look at your circumstances, they look at the child's circumstances and the other party's circumstances, they look at everything. Generally, the professionals comes on board. The family advocate, they will investigate this matter. And if they decide what that it is best for the minor child to be in your primary key, they'll make the decision because the child's best interest is of paramount importance. If they make the decision that the child should be in the other party's primary care, they'll make that decision. So my guess is as good as yours based upon this data. But if you feel that you want to have primary key, key, you need to put your best foot forward and try to motivate to the court why you believe the child will be best cared for by you. And now the last question before you going back to the Zoom. If you, have, if you want to put up your hand, do so now. Question number 17 from Limpopo. Thank you for joining us, Limpopo. Future maintenance not in the Pension Act and the lack of it in the Pension Fund. Oh, I think the, the person is, is basically asking the question here um, regarding future maintenance. Can you attach pension funds and how does it apply? Um, that is very, very sad because um, I honestly believe that a person should be entitled to attach a pension fund. Um, but it's one of those things that the maintenance act does not necessarily allow that you can attach somebody's pension fund while the person is deployed for the Pacific fund. Um, I might be wrong, um, 
I will have to relook that as well. But what can happen is if a person is acquiring money every month or is entitled to have a lump sum, and that specific money can be attached. Thank you for that. For those who have posed questions, next week again, we're back same time, same place, and we can elaborate further. Let us deal with the Zoom questions, and that will be the basically the end of this. Hi. If there is a parenting agreement signed and contact as per the agreement, father access to contact is supervised by the, fa by the father's mother, and introduction of contact was done over six months period to get more. Now the father once again has taken me back to the children's court in unfound allegations and concerned that this is the second time in the children's court when I have primary visits over the child. A social worker is on the case and have not found any of the 13 allegations to be true. Father is abusive and that's why he was separated in the first place and we are unmarried and he neglect to pay maintenance. That was agreed by the children's court. I see this is what we're having over here is we have a serial litigator, someone that always approaches a maintenance court, always trying to always causing problems, always um, you know despite there being any merits, he will still go to the maintenance court. My advice to you is you know the court is, is in a difficult position. The court can't say, okay, you're not allowed to ever come to the children's court and lay a complaint because what if at one point the father has good grounds for this specific thing so i always advise parties under these circumstances have a third party being appointed a social worker or facilitator a pending coordinator that's the term i want to use so before anybody approaches a court you first need to go through this third party pending coordinator to basically audit or to filter out unnecessary grievances and if there are valid grievances of course then the person can go to court but obviously with the permission of the pending facilitator because he would have look through the system first and analyze everything if there aren't any merits for it then obviously the penalty facilitator would not have given a certificate and has this person gone to court based upon the penalty facilitator not agreeing to it the court can maybe potentially make a cost order against the specific person i hope that assists you with some advice that is off the cuff advice i have for you and the last question i have i would just like to find out what can i do on an incident that i came across while visiting my son at a temporary foster care. On the one visit, I arrived to find that my son was full of bruises, spike marks and scratch marks, especially bruises on his ear and around his neck. I took photos. I would like to find out what I can do. Can I open up a case with the police for abuse? I have contacted the owner of the home and they deny that there are any marks. Now, I think the challenge you'll have is to, with the police, I mean, the, the the police will obviously have to investigate the matter. I'm not saying do not do that, but there needs to be some investigation within the foster care system. So you maybe have to go to someone further, Department of Social Development, to deal with this matter. And I would say that might be the better thing to do. Um, is it abuse? Is it a child maybe fighting with another child? I do not know. Is it, is it a child maybe getting some flea bites? I do not know. I'm, I'm just saying, speaking generally, speculating here. So the question, of, the question I have over here is, you may want to consider going above the ladder. Oh, that's a noon gun in the Western Cape. Or maybe you, you, you heard that. Um, and I think I'll have to deal with this quickly before I hear some noise upstairs. Prime reason C is that the child stay with me, the biological mother. Protection order was issued and we signed agreement in protection order court, domestic violence court, I presume, that he will stop the abuse. Okay. But he has not stopped the abuse behavior towards me in front of the child. Thank you. If the person doesn't stop the abuse and there's a protection order in place, he is in violation of the order, I would strongly advise you to go lay a complaint at the domestic violence court and lay a complaint regarding this. I mean, it's a criminal offense to violate the domestic violence order. So do that. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's 12 o'clock on the dot. Thank you very much. And the person that commented here, thank you very much as well. Next week, we'll have it better set up. As I said, the last time we had this live one was in March, unfortunately. But hopefully we will warm up again and try to figure this thing out as we go along. Have a lovely day. Thank you for joining us. Please, by tomorrow, a notification will be sent out again for the new next Zoom webinar. Please register for that as well for next week. You're welcome to interact. You're welcome to ask questions. You're welcome to post questions. I try my best to deal with all the questions. And by that way, we can all learn and, and benefit from each other. Have a lovely day. Thank you.